Willis McClure's family settled here in Kentucky in the early 1800s. This is home. It's home for the birds too, anytime they want to drop in. <laughs> McClure is one of about 30 landowners who provide rest stops for rare whooping cranes during their very first migration. Beautiful, wonderful. There's only about the less than 500 of them alive in this world, and they're about, to, they stand about four and a half feet tall, and they've got almost eight foot wingspan. And they're, I just never seen anything like them myself. Not very many people have. Only one other flock of whooping cranes migrates from Canada's Northwest Territories to the Gulf Coast in Texas. Then this man had an idea. Precocial birds like whooping cranes leave the nest as soon as they're hatched. And birds like that imprint on, the, on their parent. They imprint on the first thing that pays attention to them, that nurtures them, that looks after them. That's normally their parent. And all we do is substitute for the parent and turn into surrogate parents. From the moment they're hatched in a laboratory in Maryland, whooping crane chicks imprint on humans disguised as adult birds. When they're about a month old, the chicks start to follow an ultralight on the ground. And then they're taken to Wisconsin, where they begin flight training. Start out as three, three groups or three cohorts. We have 18 birds. They're all, as the summer goes on, they're all socialized together and put into one unit. As soon as they're able to fly together, uh, fly formation behind the trikes real well, then it's time to start migration. By the time they take off on a 1,200 mile journey from Wisconsin to Florida, they're only about five months old and nearly full grown. The instinct to migrate is natural. The route is learned. And all we're doing is substituting for the pair to teach them the route. That's all we do. But in order to keep them wild, the cranes never see or hear their human handlers. At each stopover, the cranes are coaxed into pens. And the next day begins before dawn. We help the pilots prep the ultralights. Usually there's defrosting this time of year. Uh, ground crew discusses our plan for departure, how to release the birds from the pen. And then the pilots get ready, check their radios and instruments, put on their helmets, and take off. The lead pilot circles back to the cranes, who are waiting. They're just not focused on the ultralight when they're flying. They're actually looking back and forth at the ground, memorizing the route as they go. People make fun of bird brains, but the bird brains in these whooping cranes is able to memorize the 1,200-mile journey and repeat it six months later. And by then, they're much better flyers than their surrogate parents. The motorized migration takes about two months. And when they fly back north on their own, Riding thermals and soaring for hundreds of miles a day, the cranes will return in about a week. And what's it like to fly with these rare birds? It is magical. It's awesome. It's inspiring. It's incredible. And it's a, a combination of a lot of things up there with the birds. Everybody who's up there, I mean, they're doing it because they absolutely love it. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. This is it. So far, none of the 64 whooping cranes who use the eastern flyway have reproduced in the wild. But experts are hoping they will in the spring. It will take at least five more years and about $8 million for the flock to reach sustainable numbers. Operation Migration intends to keep flying until 125 whooping cranes are migrating on their own between Wisconsin and Florida. For Assignment Earth, I'm Gary Stryker.